Hello, and welcome to another episode of Sensational She Geek Live from Yancey Street. This is episode 9A. Today is Monday, March 15th, 2021, and here is the lineup for this week's Monday episode. Normally, I would start by talking about the Friday episode of WandaVision that just premiered. However, there was no Friday episode of WandaVision because it ended last week. Um, So this Friday, I actually watched Assembled, the making of WandaVision, and we'll go into talking about that a little bit. After that, we talk about Superman and Lois, episode three, which I finally did watch over the weekend and very much enjoyed. And then as Zack Snyder's Justice League is coming out on Thursday, I have 12 points that I would like to see in the movie based on things that have been teased and promised since this whole release of Snyder Cut effort began. So I talk about all 12 of those points, things I expect to see, hope to see, etc. And then, of course, Falcon and the Winter Soldier starts this Friday. I will be reviewing it the, you know, Monday after that. Um, So expect that on the next Monday episode. And so we'll talk a little bit about what I am excited for, what I am hoping to see, things like that. And then there's a brief note on the Grammy nominations. However, this week I'm going to start, actually, with my comic book pull list, including spotlights on several different female comic characters who star and co-star in various titles this week. And then before we go into all of that TV, um, movie, news kind of stuff. So we'll go ahead and get started on the comic book pull list. We'll be going over uh, for those spotlights on female characters. It is Women's History Month, just so you are reminded of that. It'll be Carol Danvers' Captain Marvel for Captain Marvel 27. Patsy Walker's Hellcat from Iron Man number 7. Jessica Drew's Spider-Woman in Spider-Woman number 10. And Selena Kyle tracking down poison ivy in catwoman number 29 and then after that we'll have just some some very brief talk about other titles that include radiant black number two abbott 1973 number three thor number 13 x-force number 18 and justice league number 59 so let's get started with those ladies one of the things that i will be mentioning for all four of these women really, especially the first three, the Marvel women that I'll be discussing, is how I really appreciate the characters in their entirety. For really all of them, I'm going through um, and trying to read as much of their history. They are some of my favorite characters for me. They are the more popular ones of, with possibly the exception of Patsy, the more popular of my favorite characters. Um, but I do like to go through and familiarize myself with all of their history, the good times and the bad, the, the well-written eras and the less well-written eras, you know, uh, Carol Danvers has one of the most toxic Marvel stories in the history of their publishing company, um, in her, in her history that kind of comes up in what we're going to be discussing today about her. Um, and that is something that you have to remember when you talk about her as a whole. Um, they have, you know, a person is made up of their good parts and their bad parts, their good history and their bad history. So um, in appreciating all of these women, we will be mentioning uh, a lot of those things. But let's get started with Carol Danvers, who is appearing in Captain Marvel number 27 as Captain Marvel, of course. And this is written by Kelly Thompson. Thompson's been on this run since the first issue of it. Um, I think personally it's been getting a lot better. Uh, It has its ups and down moments, but there are definitely parts of comic book writing for this particular character, especially, that Kelly Thompson nails very, very well. Um, And that is, we'll talk about that in just a second. But this issue, the solicitation is saying that it's basically Carol starting her life as a single woman officially once again. The last issue ended with her breaking off with Rhodey, which I talked about in a previous episode of this podcast, how I am on Rhodey's side of this whole thing. Um, I don't think she should be breaking up with him for the reasons that she is, at least if she had better reasons, we could possibly talk then. Um, but she still loves him and he still loves her. So he's mad and she's sad is where we're at right now, basically. Um, and this is the post breakup episode, excuse me, post breakup issue where she's supposed to be, um, doing actually speed dating with her friends. They're going to be taking her out on a group speed dating night. I have no idea if the site that I saw this on is to be believed, but apparently the characters who will be taking her out are going to be L'Oreal, Jessica Drew, Jennifer Takeda, and Monica Rambeau. 
Um, what a group. There's a couple of changes in here from what Thompson would normally put into her girls night out, which is the, one of the probably best ways that it's, it's one of her best points of writing Carol. Um, it's any issue that has Carol and her friends be it fighting, hanging out, um, you know, on the phone, whatever it is, any issue that has Carol interacting with these female friends, especially, is a stellar issue coming from Kelly Thompson. Um, I've, there's a great number of them, but let's go through those characters that are going to be supposedly appearing in case you don't know who they are, because they're all really cool characters. And a couple of them haven't really appeared at one of these Captain Marvel friend nights before. So even if you are loosely familiar with the character, you may not necessarily be familiar with the characters who are her friends here. Starting with Laurie L, she is Carol's half-sister, recently discovered in the Empire event. She is her half-sister from her mother's DNA, as provided to the Kree Empire so long ago. Um, they only recently met in the Empire event, which was kind of lame, honestly, in my opinion. Um, but she was, Laurie L was probably one of the best things to come out of it. I really, really love her. And she is now the official Kree Scroll Empire Supreme Accuser, like Ronan was many years ago before he got killed off, probably multiple times if I know comics. <laughs> she recently actually appeared in the Wiccan and Hulkling one shot. Uh, it was honestly one of the best parts of it. It was a very wordy one shot. They were trying to get a lot done very quickly, <laughs> but it was nice to see her. And I'm glad to still see her appearing in a lots of places. Um, those issues where she was introduced by Kelly Thompson were excellent issues. Um, she did a phenomenal job. Remember Carol's mother recently died. Um, so she did a phenomenal job of bringing in that kind of the, the pain of the loss of her mother and now having the sister that her mother never even knew existed. Um, and it was a phenomenal arc in my opinion. And it ended very, very well before L'Oreal went off to do her accuser business with the, I guess, the Emperor, right? That would make sense. So then we have Jessica Drew. She is obviously Spider-Woman, and she is Carol's best friend. And how can I say very confidently that Jessica is Carol's best friend? Because long ago in Avengers Annual number 10, Carol was attacked by Rogue in Rogue's first ever appearance thrown off the Golden Gate Bridge, and saved by Jessica. Jess brought her to Charles Xavier, who was the boss to her buddies, the X-Men, and when it comes out that the Avengers basically let a crazy man kidnap Carol, and then she had to watch him grow old and die in a matter of days before being finally released by his crazy man power, Jessica stands by her side now, understanding the confusion, anger, gosh, discomfort, and everything that such experiences can put a person through for a very, very long time. I can go into that storyline. That is the um, one of the most toxic Marvel stories, if not the most toxic story in Marvel history. If there's any curiosity about that, I have read it. It's uh, pretty interesting. Chris Claremont hated it. He is the one who wrote Avengers Annual Number 10, as well as a few other very key issues in Carol's history that kind of address it. Um, so he, he did, he did a little bit of what he could to write those really heinous wrongs. So Carol and Jessica have been best friends ever since this interaction back in the, oof, eighties, I believe it was, um, or was it late seventies? Gosh, who knows? I should have looked that up before. <laughs> Um, so they've, best, they've, best, they've been best friends ever since through the good times and the bad, and there have been some extremes on both ends. Good Lord. Nowadays, Jess has a baby boy and their lives are amazingly different from when they first met, but they are, I would consider them closer than ever. Moving on to Jennifer Takeda as Hazmat. She was first seen in the comics in 2010's Avengers Arena number one. She was the youngest of she is the youngest of friends Carol's friends group as far as I know being 27 uh that's my age actually her wiki says that she was 18 at the start of Avengers Arena so I did the math and then realized it was my age so there we go <laughs> Carol first encounters Hazmat to my knowledge I could be a little wrong about this the first time I see Carol encountering Hazmat at least and to my research this is what I could see um, it was at the beginning of the Kelly Thompson run when Nuclear Man kidnapped a number of female heroes, including Carol and Hazmat. Actually, I have to backtrack on what I just said about Avengers Arena. I think I read some issues of that, and I think it was Carol and Tony who were in charge of them, was it not? I could be very wrong on that. 
Um, but anyway, the first time I read them interacting was this be- towards the beginning of this, um, yeah, this Captain Marvel series when Nuclear Man kidnapped a bunch of the female heroes, including Carolyn Hazmat, and they had to fight their way out of his weird reality bubble thing. It was a whole, it was a whole thing. It was a very odd arc. Rogue was a part of it. I still don't feel satisfied with Carol and Rogue's relationship. I don't feel like that's been settled yet. I feel like they need to go back and address that some more. Um, I call Jennifer Hazmat instead of Jennifer, usually because there's already Jennifer Walters, She-Hulk, who I, you know, she gets that title Jennifer first. She was here first. So there we go. Um, and Hazmat, I think people remember her easier by her, her superpowers, her superhero name. Her powers are that she lets off radiation. So she has to wear this protective suit, like a second skin. Um, and it took her a long time to control, to learn how to control her powers, uh, to not always be credibly explosive. <laughs> Finally, we have Monica Rambeau, who is actually the first female Captain Marvel and second person to hold the title ever. If you, for some reason, feel like that's an injustice to uh, the Cree Marvel, uh, please know that it was actually given to her by an awestruck foreigner who witnessed her in New Orleans saving the day in her origin story, which was took place in Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number Sixteen. Uh, the name was picked up by the newspapers. She did not take it for herself. Carol and Monica first meet in 1985's Marvel Fan for number 24, which is one of those key issues for her, written by Claire- Chris Claremont. The relationship starts off very, very rocky. Um, it was the it was Carol's first time. Um, it was du- it was during her time as binary, and it was her first time finding out that Marvel is dead. Um, and she basically discovers that by meeting this new female Captain Marvel um, and asking, what did Marvel have to say about that? And it's this big awkward moment where nobody in the room realized until then that Carol didn't know Marvel is dead. She's been off being binary. It's a big, fairly rough emotional issue for Carol. Um, it's, a, it's a very good issue for the most part. Uh, the two, she and Monica, did not meet again for almost a decade afterwards. Um, and their relationship was still rocky for that first issue. Um, it takes time and, um, work and heroing together, but they become closer through the years, I would say. Um, more, more recently, definitely so. Uh, when Carol chooses the moniker Captain Marvel herself, Monica is already Spectrum, but she stopped by, she, Carol still stops by her in New Orleans to make sure that her old friend is okay with her having you're being u- her using her former name. If Monica really is in this issue, I think it's going to be the first time that these two women have met up in the comics in a good little while. As I said, Kelly Thompson does some of her best work with Carol when her friends are involved, so this issue is bound to be a winner for me. And it has the beginning of Marco Cacetto, Marco Cacetto, who is the fabulous interior artist for the current Daredevil series, which I love as well. He is doing now the ongoing covers for this series, so if you are a fan of his art, that's another reason to check this series out. Next up, I want to talk about... Uh, for probably a little bit less time, Patsy Walker's Hellcat, who appears in Iron Man, ser- the Iron Man series. This week will be number seven. It is by Christopher Cantwell with artist Kafu. Uh, they were the team who worked on Doctor Doom series together fairly recently, as well as the King of Black Iron Man Doctor Doom crossover, which and honestly, it had them fighting Santa Claus. Not even lying. That is what happened. Uh, there is a fabulous, fabulous Jen Bartel Women's History Month variant featuring Patsy in her 1940s party dress, and then it has a little corner box, which I love corner boxes, of Hellcat in her Hellcat costume, obviously. Um, I read this Iron Man series for Patsy, as I like Christopher Campbell's writing fine enough, but I'm reading this for Patsy. He happens to write her well, so it works out well. Um, The cameos by other characters are nice and fun, but yes, Patsy is definitely my my main reason for the reading, and man, has it been worth it. Campbell seems to grasp Patsy superbly. He sees her, as I've said at the beginning, and he sees her as the whole picture not just what's been recent not just the one era that they really that he as a writer really really loved he takes into account the entire picture when writing the character how they would react to any given moment or situation and it works out beautifully 
I had often in the past privately critiqued her later on, her, I guess, more recent solo series, series because while they are very fun and lighthearted for the most part, uh, they stuck to a lot of the happy-go-lucky, girl-next-door, best-friend-to-everyone uh, kind of aspects of her personality, but that she's still useful in a fight, I guess, so they did touch on her fighting still a little bit. Uh, but they didn't really touch on anything beyond that, those aspects. The, the You have the trauma hidden behind... This is actually a um, little layout of her, her life here. She has the trauma hidden behind publicity and marketing that was her upbringing. She has the dreadful first marriage and extremely messy divorce. It was a somewhat violent first marriage as well. She has the initial re relationship as a friend to the Avengers. And then she has becoming Hellcat and immediately leaving to join Moondragon on the Moon Titan, on a moon in space, for learning and studying mental powers. That's pretty intense. And then she returns to join the Defenders, where she had some incredible friendships and some incredible female empowerment moments. She has a sudden romance with Damon Hellstrom following her actual demonic possession that included the brief belief that she and Damon were siblings, then that has their marriage and subsequent start to her disconnection from the Avengers, Defenders, and all of her relationship ties, her sacrifice for Damon that ends, is, that ends in her losing her mind, and then being talked into suicide by a monster, being brought back from the dead on accident they meant to bring back Mockingbird, reaffirming her status as a hero, with a fairly large span of powers who doesn't take any crap and then they kind of drop it off so you can see why I would be critical of series that don't take into account all of that stuff and really just focus on uh, the friendships life as a teen idol and the happy-go-lucky Hellcat aspects of her personality in the modern era um hellcat doesn't have her mental abilities anymore they took those away from her and she tends to not have her metal claws that extend from her gloves the way they did in the original hellcat suit um the they've made a reappearance though i think i'm trying to recall i think it was cantwell who, who had them made a reappearance recently in this in this iron man series i remember seeing that somewhere i think it was there um so hopefully if they may have made that reappearance the mental abilities will as well so i really appreciate cantwell being able to um write patsy as all of these things not as a um, well, he's kind of is writing her as a broken person right now because the situation of what's been happening, um, has been really tearing, tearing down all of this, to be honest, PTSD about these things that have happened to her. Um, but then she has, she has Tony still, so she's not on her own. She's, she's been through mental breaks before that was you know how she died that was why this is all kind of happening because she's afraid that this is going to happen and it's going to get as bad as it got before um but she has tony this time um part of the reason that it was so so bad before after she married damon um and after he became son of satan i guess kind of officially um he had cut her off from all of her friendships the avengers the defenders all of those ties that make her you know, that pa that side of Patsy. He had cut all of that off. She didn't have anybody to talk to, to ask for help, to see that she needs help, to, to you know, for anything. And now she has Tony, and that is, that is actually the incredibly big difference between uh, putting characters through difficult times by their own versus with somebody to support them. Um, it helps a lot. So really loving what Cantwell's doing with Patsy. I can definitely see that there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, and I don't think it's going to go poorly for her at all because he has been going on social media about he is a very, very big Patsy Walker fan and a Hellcat fan, so there is no reason that he would be doing something awful to her. He's giving her an arc that is going to end with her healing over these things that have until this point never been touched on and that's why it's gotten so bad now is because it's never it's been ignored until now and now she has to um, address these terrible PTSD things that she has before she can move on as a better person. Next up we have Jessica Drew as Spider-Woman in, you guessed it, Spider-Woman number 10. This is by Carla Pacheco, who is fabulous, and it is another issue that has a wonderful Jen Bartel Women's History Month variant, 
since Jessica premiered first in the late 70s, she has her on the cover in this fabulous, fabulous red and black uh, kind of pinstriped suit top with a red skirt. It is gorgeous. You should check it out. And of course, she has the lovely corner boxes that I love with the Spider Woman in her Spider Woman costume. Like other women that I've mentioned so far here, Jessica Drew has a very complicated, painful history that a lot of writers do try to dance around and avoid, but it actually does her far more credit when you acknowledge those hard times as much as has as her successes. Carla Pacheco is doing just that with the current Spire Woman series. She is allowing Jessica to face her darkness because the because as long as ugly as a road that that might be, it's the only way to really get better and to heal from that hurt, just like I said with Patsy. Jessica was actually born to a mother and a father scientist, um, like, like a species or something. Uh, he ex- experimented on her mother before birth, so she came out, you know, not quite human or whatever. Uh, Jessica was raised as a lab experiment, kind of, in a German fortress, brainwashed to be a Hydra agent, When she got old enough, they even gave her, um, like, this fake lover guy to fall in love with before fake killing him off in order to further convince her to stick with Hydra. It was this whole setup. So when she discovers discovers the truth uh, and her whole upbringing is a lie, she ends up running away to America. After spending some time homeless, she eventually starts heroing and makes friends in the community that way. But that's not all. Not long after joining the Avengers for the first time, it's which actually was a lot more modern. It was in the 2000s. It wasn't like it was in the 2000s. It's more modern than you probably thought. Uh, it's revealed that Jessica Drew, that we knew for the past several years, has actually been the Scroll Queen posing as Jessica Drew. The real Jessica was kidnapped and like in stasis and there's a prisoner somewhere on a scroll thing. You know, she was gone. Um, coming back the real Jessica coming back meant that she had to face her entire existence having been replaced and owning the fact that no one trusts her anymore because her entire existence had just been replaced by a scroll queen. So, um, there is quite a bit of darkness to the history of Jessica Drew. Carla Pacheco is embracing the crap out of that right now. Um, even though, yes, she did like like Hellcat, she did have some previous series that did like to gloss over the life and times and history of Jessica Drew. Um, once again, uh, pretending that the bad times never happened does no credit to anyone. It actually does them more credit when you acknowledge that they had those bad times and have gotten through them and are now a better person from having survived them or, you know, learned from them or whatever. Um, it doesn't help putting them through bad times and not learning anything, you know? Uh, so, uh, well, Jessica has a son now and he hasn't made an appearance in this Spider-Woman series, which honestly I love. Pacheco hasn't written him off. She's acknowledged him. She's spoken about her son because what she's doing right now, what Jessica is doing right now is trying to find a cure to her problems that are coming with her being you know, a former experiment from Hydra, basically. And having had a son, those problems are genetically transferred to him. And now it turns out that she has a brother, as well as a bunch of robot mothers, LMD mothers, at least, life model decoys, um, and a niece. I still feel like the brother and the niece are probably full of crap, but um, we'll we'll find out about that. It's going to add, it's going to add to the darkness. Um, it's a very metal Spider Woman series for things that we've normally seen for the character, and I am very pleased with it. Um, art is fantastic, everything about it is really fantastic, and I am looking forward to hopefully seeing it continue for a good while into the future. And finally, we have Selena Kyle, who is tracking down Poison Ivy in Catwoman number 29. This issue has a absolutely stunning Jenny Frizen variant of Selena stealing a gem out of a museum or something. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of Jenny Frizen, and I am super excited to um, see Poison Ivy hopefully coming back into comics regularly soon. Um, I am going to break down the scoop, which uh, I'm a big fan of Poison Ivy, but not the kind who harass creators online about her, um, because that's just the trash thing to do, but unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who do it for various characters. But anyway, um, I know I've talked about this a lot in previous episodes, but here is the Ballad of Poison Ivy as it stands so far. 
Uh, she was killed by Wally West in Heroes in Crisis. She was brought back at the end being a, as a being of the green. Uh, being like, you know, Swamp Thing is of the green, etc. She adventured with Harley in Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy, the six-issue series by Jody Hauser that came directly after that, where she learned to control her new garden body, uh, since she doesn't have really a normal body anymore. This is all made out of plant life, and she discovered that she can kind of birth new selves, new bodies. It was kind of odd, um, odd way to take things, honestly. It ended with her splitting off from Harley because Harley was set on being a hero and Ivy wasn't. Um, and she felt like she was betrayed because of the whole double body thing. It was a weird situation. In Batman, the, the Batman Joker War anthology one shot, it showed the two of them had recently reunited in a Gotham hideout, but Harley had left for too long to fight the Joker and Ivy saw that as a betrayal of their relationship, burned the whole place down and left calling herself Queen Ivy. In Future State Batman, or Future State the Next Batman number four, there were a two part, uh, it was number, there was a two part siren story starring Poison Ivy and Catwoman and this little robot siren lady uh, where Selina mentions that Ivy and Harley are odd again, off again romance things. And that was the kind of the first time they really um, started confirming their romance in canon. And then in Batman Urban Legends number one, which is another anthology story, it was confirming that was just uh, like last week or two weeks ago that Harley and Ivy are in a relationship, romantic relationship, or at least were. And Harley is pining for her now runaway lover now that she finds their Gotham hideout is empty. In the upcoming Harley Quinn ongoing series, it features Ivy on a couple of the covers, but there's no mention of her in the solicitations. For Catwoman, the this week's issue mentions her looking for Ivy, and then she's on the cover of a two the May issue, so two months from now, she's on the cover of it. So this is going to be a whole arc with Selina and Ivy. Um, and then you have the Swamp Thing, which is written by the same person, Rom V, as Catwoman, and uh, issue three has Ivy solicited as a character who's going to appear. So uh, basically what I'm saying is this is the time of Ivy, or at least I'm ready for it to be. Just please don't make her a hero. She's an environmental terrorist. Thank you very much. Um, I don't, I, I know there's a lot of Ivy stands who would like her to be called a hero. I don't think that's a good take on her. <laughs> um, uh, anti-hero is probably the closest to hero she'll ever be. Um, this Catwoman run, um, I'm still trying to get on board with the writer. I've enjoyed things from him in the past, but it's been hard uh, seeing Selena as the version of the character that he writes. Um, that's just me. I, I don't dislike it nearly enough to make me stop collecting it for the Jenny Frizen covers. Um, and I'm not really, I'm not really positive right now where they stand with Selena's origin. I imagine her first solo series, which was four issues by Mindy Newell in, uh, 1989. I'm sure it was in inspired a little bit by Frank Miller, Miller's version of it, of her, um, it must be canon because that's got the whole sisters, their time as orphans, etc. Which would I guess would mean that Miller's Year One is technically canon too, because I think it's loosely referenced in that. Um, but I really read, I really enjoyed that original Catwoman run. Those four issues, it's very fun. I think it's called My Sister's Keeper is how they they titled it eventually. Um, I actually really enjoyed it. It's very artistic. The pages are black. It's beautiful. Uh, it's a very good series. So uh, still keeping up with this Catwoman because I have a great love for Selena Kyle as a character. And then I just have uh, one, two, three, four, five other comics I briefly want to kind of talk about for just a minute. First is Radiant Black number two. The first issue um, it basically seems to be about a really, really down on his luck adult man who has had to move back in with his folks, discovers that there's some kind of glowing blue orb thing floating in the air. When he touches, it turns him into this like racer, Tron looking being with the power to do things as yet undetermined or clarified things, but it does include some kind of gravity manipulation. And there is at least one other Tron looking type person with these powers potentially who is going about. However, it seems that they're using their powers for evil where I guess this dude just wants to use them to survive 
has yet to be determined, but it was enough um, to get me to re pick up the second issue, so I'll be picking that up this week. Abbott 1973, number three, is starring a queer black female journalist, so it is one of the most representational comics this week, period. Thor, number 13, um, the pissing contest between Donny Cates and Jason Aaron continues. On the Cates side, you have the King in Black event, the current Thor, Venom, and an ex inexplicably overpowered Donald Blake with his creepy stands. On the Aaron side, you have longtime Thor writer, Avengers writer, Jane Foster writer, and generally just a bit being a bit more of a pro. So take that as you will. I love seeing Throg in the comics. I'm glad Throg hasn't been killed off, but it was really weird how Throg and Lockjaw beat a character, right? The character is beaten. They take him to a third character, Doctor Strange. The character wakes up, who was beaten, and has now somehow beats Throg, Lockjaw, and Doctor Strange. Go fucking figure. Uh, but all right. X-Force number 18, Kid Omega's worst day ever continues, except this time he isn't the one dying, everyone else is dying, and someone who looks like him is the one doing the murdering. I really love the fun little arc we've had here with Kid Omega. It's, um, fun. <laughs> and I like his relationship with the, uh, Cuckoo sister, and it's, it's just a, it's just a, it's a... I, I can't think of a word but fun right now, but it's fun. It is fun. And I do, I do, while I say I don't particularly enjoy the Wolverine by Benjamin Percy, this X-Force, I do. I definitely do enjoy. And finally, I have to mention <laughs> Justice League number 59. I still can't decide if I'm going to pick this up or not, but I have to mention it because DC totally pump faked us with the blacked out when they released the images of this new lineup of the Justice League for the Brian Michael Bendis Justice League. It was blacked out faces across everybody, including a mysterious Amazon and a new Batman, who we were clearly meant to assume, based on the time of this release, uh, an announcement that it was going to be Nubia and Tim Fox. Based on several different reveals happening at the time of Wonder Woman and Batman. Then several days later, it was revealed actually to be Hippolyta for some reason. She's always hated a man's world and wouldn't have a reason to go into it. Diana's death be damned. Supposed death, I guess, be damned. And the other one is just Bruce Wayne. Okay. After how Future State went, honestly, John Ridley should be the main Batman writer right now, and Tim Fox should be the only new Batman. The only current Batman. I feel like Bruce... I feel like they were kind of trying to shut him out with the whole... You don't have money anymore. You're a dark detective now. But now he's back. Um, all right. I guess that's fine. I honestly preferred how John Ridley wrote Tim Fox over anything that's been Batman since Tom King stopped writing Batman. Honestly, I think I prefer having Tim Fox as Batman to Bruce Wayne in the modern era just because, oh God, so many reasons. But... <laughs> Uh, this, I, I, Justice League 59, I am still peeved about that whole pump fake they definitely did on purpose for us. Um, so, I, I just can't get on board with Hippolyta trying to, caring at all about man's world anymore. Like, if Diana died for them, that, I feel like she would just be like, no, screw you guys, I'm gonna stay here in my perfect little island, you can all rot. It's so not Hippolyta to say anything basically but that to man's world. I don't know. Maybe she has this new era of peacefulness in her or something, whatever. Um, but that wraps up the week's um, poll list notes. Uh, coming up, we have segments on Assembled, The Making of WandaVision, Superman and Lois Episode 3, Zack Snyder's Justice League notes, <laughs> which I have extensive on, and some other mentions and notes on Falcon and Winter Soldier, which is premiering Friday, and the... Oscar nominations, which we just um, heard about. I think I said Grammy nominations in the intro. Either way, it is Oscar nominations that I meant. Next up, we have Assembled, the making of WandaVision. There was a lot of things that were not in this that I kind of was hoping would be in it, but I'll get it toward that at the ending um, and instead talk about what was in it. The first thing that really stuck out with me right away was um, how everybody in the episode kind of talked about how the sitcom aspect of the show, uh, they talked about it like it was out of left field or totally bizarre or unbelievable or shocking or something like that. Um, and I gotta say, uh, while I was stoked, completely stoked to find out uh, that it was going to be a sitcom and everything, 
the concepts made a ton of sense right away and clicked as to why they would want to do that basically from the start. If you read the comics and are familiar with Wanda's storylines and her history, you know that she has a tendency to be a bit breakable and that her magic is definitely unpredictable. If you've read Avengers Disassembled in House of M, you know just how powerful she is and that she has, in the comics, actually created a false reality in what her image of the perfect world might be. And knowing these things, the announcement of WandaVision as a sitcom was really a dream come true for comics readers that we never really knew we had in the first place. It was fairly clear the sitcom wasn't going to be real and it was going to be Wanda's little world somehow. Um, it was a genius and completely excellent idea, very fitting, but I wouldn't really call it surprising necessarily. Um, it's all based around things that already have happened in the comics, which if you're a big fan of the movies, the MCU stuff, then you should be... Um, <laughs> I guess there's a lot of MCU fans who don't really like the comics, um, specifically don't like the comics. Um, I don't get that. You're about five to 20 years ahead of things appearing in the, com in the, in the MCU, so you know, whatever. Uh, the showrunners, they actually talked to Dick Van Dyke about the Dick Van Dyke show, asking him what it was really, what it really was that made his sitcom work. What was the formula? Uh, what they said was, what they said he said was that the live audience is key and knowing how to read and respond to their reactions was what makes it perfect. Uh, based on that, all the sitcom scenes in WandaVision were actually filmed in front of a live studio audience. The laughter is real. It's really all real which I was very impressed to discover as well. Um, I really loved the moment of Elizabeth Olsen, who of course plays Wanda Maximoff, talking about her time growing up on the set of Full House, a show that I watched when I was growing up. She said that it's surreal to be there, uh, to, be, to be living all of this out when she spent all those years watching it happen from behind the scenes. Uh, Lizzie Olsen is, of course, the younger sister to Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen, if you didn't know, who co-starred as the youngest daughter, Michelle Tanner, in Full House. Um, I, Lizzie has had a very different career path than her sisters. Um, the biggest shocker I would say in the entire episode of this uh, assembled behind the scenes thing was finding out that Paul Bettany wasn't actually done up like Vision onto film every day. In fact, he never was. Instead, he was just covered in face paint, his whole head, covered in a bald cap, covered in face paint with tiny little white dots marking his face for the computers to pick on in or pick up on in order to digitally create the, the face of Vision later on. Um, and the funniest part of seeing all of that was the pictures of how this made Bettany look. He was painted red, right, blue, uh, or red, I guess I should say he was painted red, white, or blue. He was bald and his ears were sticking out. I never knew vision with ears would look so hilarious and ridiculous, but it does. Uh, I definitely recommend you looking up those pictures because they will give you some laughs. And yes, he was painted blue. I did say he was painted blue, um, looking very blue man crew. He was blue because for the grayscale portion of the show, which was really just, I think, most of the first episode, blue was the color that they found translated to appear like red to human eyes best when in grayscale. Uh, it's a really cool concept that kind of messes with your head about how color isn't real it's various wavelengths of light bouncing off of a surface and how the cones in our the cones and rods in our eyes interpret that as color to our brain um it's really fun to think about funky to think about at least so i guess the blue turned grayscale appears to the human eye as red more than red turned grayscale it's real funky stuff a couple cast members um they didn't talk too much. You mostly had Wanda, honestly. Tiana Paris is about, she's Monica. She talked about her audition tape a lot, um, how they didn't give any context to anything, but she just went by the notes of playing it up and not taking it too seriously. And she's, like I've said many times about WandaVision, Tiana Paris has been a fabulous Monica. Uh, they really did pick the perfect person. Then we have Evan Peters talking about how much he loved the meta-ness of him being there and he loved working with Kevin Feige. Catherine Hahn talking about how much she loved being able to play a character who's evil and funny and smart. Um, and I, I really think you can see that enjoyment on screen. She has a great time with it. And then, of course, the actors for Jimmy Woo and Darcy were both glad to be back. Um, we also learned that while the episodes were finished at the time of the premiere, they were not solidi solidified. 
editing changes were made still based on audience reactions to certain episodes or certain elements of episodes uh, like thinking Mephisto was involved so they added more demonic elements to kind of egg us on stuff like that you know um, I'm a little bit boggled that they could even do that they did also mention the plot they I guess clarified the plot and the ending of the series would always planned on being the same it was just scene retention and things that they changed as, um, as you know things like that, that they changed as we watched and responded to based on articles and things that I've read uh, one other example that I've kind of pieced together that they planned on having a scene with Monica and the twins but uh, the twins ended up being not nearly as popular as Monica so that scene was replaced with another one before that episode premiered it was stuff like that it ends up with the same uh, final battle scene but there was different roads to get there um, I do definitely wish that we had more behind the scenes stuff uh, like with writers at the very very least but also costume design, music, makeup, things like that. I would love to see the inside scoop on their designs and characters so much more. We did get a tiny little bit, but it was mainly just Olsen talking about the Halloween episode and how she originally hated the idea of wearing those old school Wanda's tights and leotards, but now she has this, love, this bigger love for the source material, so she found it much more endearing. Um, but still, there was none of the outfit designers or makeup and hairstyle people, really, which I'd have loved to see for sure. I'm especially surprised the writers didn't talk about the source material at all, but maybe they were too afraid of giving things away for coming TV and movie material? Who knows? Um, I remember falling in love with behind-the-scenes features when I watched hours and hours of Pirates of the Caribbean, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, those featurettes and bonus special features. You get to hear how the people made the thing that you love. Talk about why and how they made it so good. Um, and I feel like a little this behind the scenes could have used a little bit more of that, but I'll just kind of blame time restraints for that right now. It was a good episode. I think I kind of touched on everything that stood out. Um, the, like I said, there wasn't anything too deep about anything. It was all just the experience of having filmed it, which is fine. Hopefully in the future we'll get some more behind the scenes. Next up, I have Superman and Lois episode three. This premiered, oh gosh, last Tuesday. So episode four, I think premieres tomorrow, which is the fifth, the 16th. Today's the 15th. Um, it starts, I guess, I, uh, there's, there's a couple of different elements that I want to talk to about. I'm probably going to get really out of order because that's just kind of how things go with me a lot of times. Um, so we'll start with things that, I guess, stuck out. You get Clark listening in on his two boys. Um, they're at school and he hears an altercation happening at the school and how Jordan is struggling to keep in control. Remember, he has the, what are they calling it, opt op optical blast or something like that? Ocular blast. <laughs> um... And so Clark then shows up before anything can happen to try and make sure nothing happens. And the boys start to feel mad and betrayed because it feels like an invasion of privacy. And I, L-O-V-E, I love seeing Clark Kent struggle to be a human father, regardless of taking off the, for to do hero shit and all that all the time. Because he's still, he's still raised human. He thinks like a human for the most part. He has wor human worries for his family. He has the same daily struggles of parenting human children. It, the show shows that he's Superman, yeah, but he doesn't, that doesn't make him perfect by any means. He has a lot of decisions to make in his personal life, um, and he makes a lot of the wrong decisions sometimes. <laughs> One thing I also wanted to point out was interesting about the boys' relationship is that no matter how much they argue amongst each other, they seem to be a team when it comes to their parents. They defend one another, they look out for each other, etc. Um, this also gives me the hope that they won't go for the cliche light versus dark sun arc, which would probably keep me from coming back to the show after that. <laughs> That's a bit too cliche for me. Um, at one point, Jordan tries out for football, Jordan being the son who has... Um, the belief, the general belief among the family is that he has the Kryptonian something to him and John doesn't, even though I have thoughts on that. But anyway, uh, Jordan tries out to football. He completely whoops everyone as asses, makes John look bad, um, including the players who bully him and his brother. The 
the two boys, they try to hide it from their parents for a while because Jordan makes all these excuses about how their parents hid so much from them. But then when their parents do find out, there really isn't anything for the parents to do except for just go ahead and let him play. But Clark decides to be joint coach as volunteer. Um, so that's just going to add more complication to his time. There's a really funny scene with him and John carrying a water tub and he pretends that it, you know it's too heavy. Um, I'm curious how he'll add this to his schedule. Um, sure, it'll make it easier to spend time with his sons while also keeping an eye on them, but his powers as Superman will no doubt be called upon while he's coaching one day, if not one day when he's the only adult in charge. And that's going to cause some problems in the future. You can guarantee that. We have Lois. She starts digging deeper into the Morgan Edge stuff at her new job as a Smallville reporter, and right away her car gets bombed. So clearly things are more intense in Smallville than she thought. Uh, when she gets a hot tip, the woman who did the tipping ends up half dead in a closet or bathroom or something while Lois is facing off with her attacker. Uh, she does her whole Superman call thing, and he shows up and actually finds that the attacker is more than he seems, and Superman can't actually overpower him at all. My initial thought was that this guy must be Kryptonian, but I feel like Clark would sense that, so I started leaning a lot harder on one of those Superman pills, a la All-Star Superman, um, where you take it and for, like a, for a day you have the powers of Superman. The other writing theory in the household is that he is an early version of Mazo, which does make a lot of sense, actually. He looks a bit like the character in the comics already with his plain bald head and his plain clothes, and he didn't really speak too much, if at all. Um, he also seemed to be able to match the strength of whoever he fought, uh, which is an Amazo thing since Amazo learns as he fights, which I would say that because he could match Superman's strength but didn't totally destroy Lois previous to that when he was fighting her. Then we have at the end of the episode, interestingly, the same attacker, um, the, that dude, who, whether he's a Mazo or what, he is stopped on a road at night and killed by a Kryptonian woman. Um, I would say she's probably Feyora Ul, who is Zod's second in command. Um, she probably doesn't come from that same alternate reality as Lex, although she definitely might be working with that alternate reality Lex at this point. It would be um, an enemy of my enemies, my you know friend situation because they would both be against Superman. And then while I don't think the show has shown it explicitly, I still think John Ken is going to end up showing some, showing some sort of Kryptonian powers as well. I think that there's no way Lois is going to have twins with Kal-El and only one are, is going to come out with a single Kryptonian power. His alien DNA is all over those boys' genetics. Something is bound to pop up sooner or later, and I'm willing to bet the next power reveal is going to be John's. I am really enjoying the show. I still feel like this is one of the best Superman products we've had in a good while. I am enjoying so much seeing him struggle as a parent, as well as this new Superman stuff he's dealing with, uh, whatever the new Lex stuff he's bringing with him may or may not be. And I look forward to the next episode. I'll be talking about that probably either next Monday or this coming Friday. We shall see. The last big ticket item on the podcast agenda today is, well, before some just general little news things, is Zack Snyder's Justice League. The fact that it's coming out Thursday, I have 12... Technically, it's more than that, but I, I made it, I kind of combined some. So it's 12 points of expectations, things that are make or break points for me. If they appear in the Justice League movie, I will be satisfied. If they don't, I will definitely, definitely not be satisfied because these are things that ever since the release, the Snyder Cut thing, whole thing started, Snyder was saying that these are things that were going to be in his original vision, and that if the Snyder Cut was released the way he wanted it, this is what would be in it. So these are my expectations, as laid out by Zack Snyder himself. So let's go ahead and get into this. We got 12 points here, starting with number one, various Amazon business. Um, basically, I already know I'm going to be massively disappointed with their outfits, um, the Amazons of Wonder Woman were dressed fantastically, but the Amazons of the Justice League looked like the, quote, slutty Halloween costume versions of them. It was so bad. It took me out of the movie. I remember stopping watching and saying, oh God, out loud in the theater. It was truly embarrassing to see, honestly, that an adult man who calls himself a filmmaker 
translated something we had already gotten in cinema that poorly into his own version. Um, we are also supposed to be getting more Themyscirian scenes, including a Wonder Woman flashback to when she was younger. Not sure if that means a younger purse actress than Gal Gadot or if it'll be Gal Gadot. And we were supposed to see Antiope, her teacher, as a young woman. Point the second. Kilowog. One of the two major claims that Snyder made, I would say the two biggest claims that Snyder made, was about Kilowog, who was going to appear in an end credit scene of the Justice League alongside John Jones as Martin Martian Manhunter, who was the second major claim. Kilowog is a big, pink, hog-like, boar-like Green Lantern, who is a bit of a fan favorite, so it's a pretty explosive claim, it's a pretty serious claim that he was going to have... Um, that Snyder was going to have Kilowog appear in his original version of the movie. That leads me to John Jones, of course. Like Kilowog, Martian Manhunter is a must for Zack Snyder's Justice League to be a success for me at all. Not only is he a massively legendary character and often the seventh member of the Justice League, he's another alien, and this time a green one who is much more humanoid than Kilowog. It came out some time ago, um, that I think earlier this year, that the military character played by actor Harry Lennox in Man of Steel was in fact meant to be Jon Jones himself in disguise. That was a rumor that had been going around for a while, and they did finally confirm it. In the comics, Jon Jones' favorite human forms are a black man and an Asian woman. Yes, really. Um, it was exciting to see that information get confirmed, but we'll have to wait and see if Lennox reappears in CGI costume in this new version of the Justice League. If he doesn't, I will be massively disappointed. Um, probably more than I'm with most of these other things if they don't appear. I have to stop for a second here and mention that my cat is getting very cuddly right now. So if you hear some bumping on the microphone, that would be her. Um, she's she's got cat hair all over my face honestly it's quite a mess uh point the fourth i covered now the amazon's kilowog john jones point the fourth is dark side and co this was another one i condensed into one point we've seen the teases but that doesn't mean shit honestly <laughs> there's a lot of back and forth about the legitimacy of this dark side's look so we'll see how it ends up working in the final cut we didn't see him at all in the original, but I won't be satisfied with just a cameo in this. Steppenwolf was meant to be the main antagonist in the original movie, I guess, but Snyder had been, has been building up so much dark side, just so much fluff about dark side's going to be in this, dark side's going to be in this, expect dark side. I have certain expectations about this, and in what, four hours? I think he can find the time to give dark side his due glory. Additionally, we have got the tease of Granny Goodness. I would like her to see her in a somewhat more developed role. Honestly, that one I also highly, highly doubt. But you can always hope. Um, and every time I mention Granny Goodness, I have to mention Female Furies, the series that puts her and her battle team of Furies of Apocalypse in greater context. The greater context that Jack Kirby himself always wanted to publish but never got around to it. It was actually planned by him and taken and put out in, you know, modern comics by Cecil Castellucci and Adriana Mello. It was one of my favorite, favorite um, miniseries probably of all time. And speaking of the Furies, I actually do not want to see them here. I don't trust Snyder with the female Furies, really with most female characters, period. You already heard what I had to say about his Amazon outfits. That was disgusting. Honestly, it was sad. It was childish. Uh, Desaad, Darkseid's right-hand man, uh, was likely also seen in that same image of Darkseid and Granny that was already released. I guess it was a clip. It was a short little video clip. Um, he is supposed to be appearing. He's he's a real nasty piece of work. And Steppenwolf's ending, according to Snyder, was meant to be death by terror demons by order of Darkseid for failing on this mission. So all things that I expect to see, Steppenwolf being torn apart by parademons, uh, Desaad and Granny Goodness appearing alongside dark side um dark side appearing for more than just a scene definitely more than just a scene and when it comes to the warriors like uh warriors and rulers of apocalypse these are really big expectations but snyder has left them to him for himself he has been he has blown this all up to a point that um these are expectations that he put in line for himself that we all have for him due to him so if, if they're not there he only has himself to blame 
Number five, Cyborg. Of course, we all know Ray Fisher's Cyborg was meant to have a much, much bigger role in the original Justice League movie, but was pushed back a lot when director Joss Whedon took over. Uh, while Fisher was recently fired from Warner's Flash movie that is upcoming, he was meant to co-star in that. Um, he was fired for that for outing Whedon's actions. Um, we had better see the full damn version that uh, Snyder keeps insisting that he had for Victor Stone. Uh, the, the whole vision, excuse me, that he had for Victor Stone. Um, apparently, Snyder says there was so much more. Um so I'm I'm expecting so much more. It was meant to be a lot more of his father Silas Stone, I know, at Star Labs, uh, Victor's life before becoming Cyborg, and the arc of him becoming the hero after his accident that his father kind of saves him from, so to say. Uh, but we shall see. Um, uh, you gotta be aware of the whole Ray Fisher situation while watching Justice League, because while Fisher may be in this more... He's still fired from Warner Brothers' next project that he was supposed to be in because he was calling them out on the mistreatment of directors like Joss Whedon. Um, so just be aware of things like that, problematic things like that that happen behind the scenes, even if you are supporting uh, very, you know, The Flash or whatever future Warner projects uh, these guys are going to appear in, but not Ray Fisher. <laughs> Anyway, point the sixth, Ryan Choi, he is the a modern version of the Atom. He was also supposed to appear alongside Silas Stone in various scenes at Star Labs. And a teaser scene, excuse me, a teaser picture was put out by Zack Snyder some time ago, gosh, probably years ago now, with actor Orion Lee on set. So there are those scenes out there, and I 100% to see that. Orion Lee was cast as Choi. Uh, if we don't see Ryan Choi in any format in this Justice League, uh, another just very, very disappointing aspect. If he's, if it, even if it's just a little scene, that's all we expect anyway. Um, you got four hours. You can fit Ryan Choi's Adam in here for just a second. Point the seventh, we were also supposed to get more Flash, kind of. Uh, Wally West had a little bit of an arc in what we saw as the final Justice League cut, but according to Snyder, there was meant to be more, specifically involving Iris West, his comic book love interest, as played by actress Kiersey Clemens, a black woman. The rumor is the scene of the two of them, him and Iris, meeting was cut by Whedon because of, like Fisher scenes, racism. Um, Iris may be white in the comics originally, but various versions of her as a woman of color have become more common and popular, including the Flash TV show and some comic iterations. I personally like the change, as we could always use more characters of color to let fans of all types feel included in these projects. Um, we didn't... it doesn't look good for him. <laughs> it doesn't look good for him, although Warner seems to be siding with him, as well as Amber Heard. Speaking of Amber Heard, point the eighth... There is supposed to be more Atlantis. While I loathe Amber Heard and everything she stands for, admittedly there is more to Aquaman and Atlantis than her. Willem Dafoe's Volko, who is the little teacher dude, was meant to debut in, in Justice League before Aquaman, according to Jason Momoa, and have a lot more involvement in his history with Atlantis and whatnot in the story. Mera also had a bigger role. She battled Steppenwolf. I wish it wasn't Amber Heard. We could have had so many better actresses than Amber Heard playing Mara. But anyway, um, that was what was supposed to happen in the original script. And so I expect to see that here if that was stuff that he had originally planned to have in his vision. And this is supposed to be his true vision. Point the ninth. More Lex Luthor. The disappointment of Lex Luthor's role in the final project of the original Justice League was palpable. His character was incredibly underdeveloped, coming off like an edgy young adult with a high with a candy high, my cat's playing with long boxes again, rather than a frightening villain. Uh, hopefully somewhere in these six hours of this Zack Snyder Justice League, Lex will be explored a little bit better. I do recall hearing possibly that there were reshoots with some of these guys, and I don't remember if Lex was one of them. I know there were reshoots, but I just don't recall if Lex was one of them. Um, but it's got to be more scenes that were there that he was in that they could just put in there to make it better, you know? Uh, there was also supposed to be another nightmare sequence, just like in Batman vs. Superman. Um, Snyder wanted the Justice League to have a Batman nightmare sequence in it, but we didn't see the point and cut it from the script, which moves me on to point the 11th, the Joker. <laughs> uh, the Jesus metaphor is so overdone. 
in this movie. Jesus devil stuff. It's I get it. We get it. We get it. It's the most obvious metaphor about these guys you can think of. And so the Joker will probably show up in, I, I assume that nightmare sequence to Bruce based on the clips and the images we've seen of him in costume. Um, while I suppose I am glad they gave Leto another shot because let's face it, he is an Oscar winning actor. I can't help but feel the tickle of cringe in the back of my throat as I seal these promo pics of him dressed as Jesus with bulletproof vests and stuff. It's just, it's a bit, I, ugh. <laughs> Finally, point to 12. Black suit Superman. We all know this one. Superman was supposed to be in his black suit after coming back from the dead. For whatever reason, they didn't keep that in Sweden's Justice League. We've already seen a teaser of it. They've released that officially, so we know that it's going to appear... But it seems that there's not going to be any other surprises like the throwback to the mullet from the original 90s, which honestly, I would dig the shit out of that. I would be on board with the mullet. Um, They could probably make it work. If they can make Zemo work, they can make the mullet work. So those are my 12 points. Oh, also on the black suit Superman thing, that really massive puff piece that Vanity Fair put out on Zack Snyder's Justice League a couple of weeks ago... uh, for some reason claimed that Snyder was the one who decided to put Superman in a black suit. That was the 90s comics that decided that. He's just following the footprints of the comics. I just feel like I gotta say that because they that article was horrendous, honestly. It, it wrote off the people who were harassing Warner Brothers employees as, oh, they were just kids messing around. People lost their jobs. Like, that, that was not just kids messing around. That was awful stuff they did. Anyway, those are my 12 points, plus some, of Zack Snyder's Justice League, my expectations. We'll see on Thursday. I am probably going to end up doing a special on this. I'm just trying to think if I'm doing... I won't be talking about it Friday. I might start talking about it Friday, maybe. Um, But Friday, I also have my standard comic book uh, picks that I want to talk about. And then Monday, we're going to talk about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, the first episode, which who knows, I may not end up having much to say about that, but I, I doubt it. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. I may end up putting a special out for this because it is four hours. Um, hopefully there will be plenty to discuss about it. To wrap things up a little bit, I just want to mention, uh, yes, the Falcon, the Winter Soldier is coming this Friday. I will be watching it Friday night. I will not have watched it by the time that I put up my Friday podcast episode for sure. Uh, Things that I am excited for, though, is the identity of the mysterious girl. Um, I think she's probably going to be Sin leading the group of Flag Smashers. There's some people who think that she's going to be Carly, uh, the gender-swapped or the gender-bent Carl from the comics. I feel like just having her be Sin, the granddaughter or, you know, somehow other relative of Red Skull would be awesome. Then you can have Yelena Belova, you know, splash her face with acid or something and have her rip off her face the way she does in the comics to look like her predecessor, Red Skull. That shit would be cool because then that would be Yelena Belova's, you know, nemesis at that point. I think that's awesome. But we haven't seen Black Widow yet, so we don't really know what's happening with Yelena Belova besides being the future Black Widow. Uh, that's it. We don't know if she's got any other history or anything with people. Uh, Yelena Belova is also a character who I'm excited to see in this. I believe they leaked that she was going to be in it. Uh, Baron Zemo, of course, I'm excited for. It's inter- It's it's cool that they gave him that like intro during Civil War, um, and now they're following up to that with, I guess you could say, uh, the next generation of the same heroes he was pinning against each other, in a sense. Um, so it's, it's really, it's going to be cool. And they made the mask work. The, they made the stupid purple mask work. It's funny how in the comics, it doesn't work as well as it does on TV, it seems, but uh, they just, they literally just translate it directly. It just works better. It looks better on him IRL than it does in the comic. In the comic, it's ridiculous. And then they made the exact comic thing and it doesn't look so ridiculous. I just think it's so funny that it works out like that. Um, and he's going to get his finalized arc, so that's cool. Uh, obviously, we're all looking forward to the buddy cop moments between Falcon and the Winter Soldier themselves. And, of course, Sharon Carter is going to be a main character in the series. I don't think she's going to be a love interest to anybody. I think she's going to be doing her own thing. Uh, but I'm very excited for this. I am not super up with the Captain America stuff, as much as I could be at least. 
um, and they'll be bringing a lot of that in. So I will be doing research as I watch these episodes, and I will be learning things as I, um, you know, prepare to do these podcast episodes reviewing the TV episodes. So it'll be a fun experience for all of us. The last thing I wanted to talk about, I think I said Grammy in the beginning. I meant Oscar nominations. Um, this is, There's a few noteworthy things that um, have come this year. And the first one that is, I guess, shocking. Uh, surprising, but then again, not surprising. Uh, noteworthy is still good. Um, this is the first time in 93 years that there have been two, not one, two female directors nominated for Best Director. That shit's ridiculous. It's only been nine. It's it's only the first time in ninety three years. Are you kidding me? I should not be so surprised. I mean, I guess it's not surprising. It's just disappointing. It's also, on that note, Riz Ahmed breaks records or sets records, whatever, as being the first Muslim actor nominated in the Best Actor category. Again, what the hell? I did not. I, I guess I can't be surprised because we know this shit is out there. We know that the, that the racism and the sexism is so ingrained in Hollywood. But damn, seeing it really laid out like this. 93 years? First, first Muslim actor to be nominated as Best Actor? Shit, man. Um, also, Chad McBoseman was posthumously nominated for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. I haven't seen it, but he's worth mentioning as he is um, a fantastic person he was a fantastic person and he did play black panther fantastically um i haven't seen any of the movies that got nominated i don't think i've seen a single one uh birds of prey didn't get nominated for hair and makeup or costume which is probably the biggest snub that i've seen so far um i'm sure there's a lot of other snubs but that's that's <laughs> that's a pretty big one i i feel like if you just or if you are a cinema fan and you watch that movie, you have to stop and appreciate the makeup and hairstyling as well as the costume design. That shit is a bonkers good. And they didn't get nominated. Wonder Woman also didn't get nominated for anything. I, they could have been up for costume or special effects or something at best. Um, but Birds of Prey not being up for makeup and hairstyling or costume? Oof. That, that is a disservice to all of us, in my opinion. But that wraps up our podcast today. Um, I'm not sure what the length this one's going to end up being. I always stress about that for some reason. I really shouldn't. If you've made it this far into it, thank you for listening very much once again. This podcast is available on uh, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Podbean, and Spotify. So whatever service you look it up on, thank you very much. Um, uh, you can find me on social media. I am on Instagram at Anna with the comics. My name is Anna. Hi, how are you doing? You can find me on Twitter at Savage She Geek because Sensational was too many letters. And my website is www.sensationalshegeek.weebly.com. It's got the Weebly extension because I don't pay for that. Um, and I have a lot of fun stuff on my site. So you can go check that out. I haven't been writing as much because I've been working on these podcasts a lot more intensively recently, uh, which I hope is going to pay off with people enjoying them, you know, in the end or something like that. Thank you for listening. I will be back. The next episode will be this coming Friday, the 19th of March, where I will be discussing the comic book uh, picks of the week. I just, this week I discussed several of the polls, and I will be discussing the picks of the week, um, as well as possibly the first s chunk of Zack Snyder's Justice League. If I watch that, I imagine I'll watch it Thursday night, just the first chunk. I'm not going to watch all four hours. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Um, but yeah, so thank you for listening for like the fifth time and or third time. Um, and I hope to see you again on Friday tuning in. Otherwise, have a sweaty, sweaty week.